I love that. That was so good. Can we just stand on our feet? You guys need to stretch your legs. Um, just want to pray because there was a song about being children of God. And in the, the book of Ephesians, I'm going to be sharing from this morning, Ephesians chapter 4, but the start of the book of Ephesians, it gives us a picture of what it means to be uh, children of God. It talks about our, our, our redemption and what God has done in bringing us into intimacy with him, in forgiving us, cleansing us. But one of the metaphors is adoption, that we are adopted and that we are brought into the life of God and we share in his life and his love. And, and there's, this, there's no sense that we have made our way there on our own. There's very much a sense that God has brought us into his life and his love. And sometimes when you hear a song about being children of God, you think, oh, wow, some of us in this room, you might feel excluded. You might feel like, you know what, that's not me. I'm not one of those religious types or you don't know what I've done. You don't know what my doubts are. But I believe that at the heart of the universe, there is a God who is love. He doesn't just love. He is love. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And out of his love, he creates and he has revealed himself through the scriptures. He's revealed himself ultimately through Jesus who lived on this earth and lived and died in our place on our behalf. But he's also revealed so much of himself. It says that his character and his law is written in our hearts. That there's part of you and I that can connect with God, even if we don't know everything about him, that, that we are made, we are not just physical beings, we are made to be spiritual human beings and we are made in the image of God. And I just want to pray and just tell everyone here that even if you don't recognize it, I want to tell you that you are God's child. You are here because he created you and he knit you together in your mother's womb. He knows everything about you. He is, you have a biological father, but you also have a heavenly father. And for some of us, we don't recognize that, but God's love is for you. And for some of you, he's already drawing you to himself. So let's just pray together. Father, I just thank you for your loving kindness. I thank you for Jesus, your son, who we know historically was a real man and he did die a criminal's death on the cross. And a whole pile of people they turned the world upside down by sharing the story that this Jesus who was dead was now alive. And I thank you for so many of us in this room. We have an experience of the risen Christ. We have experienced the love of God poured into our hearts. And I just pray for those of us that feel a little bit on the outer. We feel like we're full of doubt, we're full of fear or full of shame. But I thank you that no, none of those words, fear, doubt or shame, are our identity or define us in your sight. I thank you that we can be children of God because of what Jesus has done. And it's not through how good or how worthy we are, but you have embraced us and accepted us so we can live for you. And Lord, so those of us that have questions or doubts, I just thank you that this morning, you are going to be kind and gentle and loving in speaking and bringing a word into our hearts that's going to help us and then it's going to lead us to you. We know that you are not a God that hides himself from his children. That You are a wonderful father and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take your seats. So I've been starting a ser doing a series called The Church We Can Be and really the first couple of weeks have been about what does an Acts 2 church look like? Basically, what does it mean to be the church that God had in mind? And when you read about the book of the, the church in the book of Acts, it's so good. It sounds like utopia. It sounds like this amazing kind of community within a community, this rough ancient society in Palestine, in the Roman Empire, 2,000 years ago. You see this small little patch of revival where people's hearts and lives are being turned upside down and the way that they live together it sounds like something out of a novel it's so beautiful and we've talked and we've painted a picture of what the church should be what the church could be but this morning I want to read from Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus not just about what we should do but how we actually become the people of God 
the how we become the church that God wants us to be. Because it's one thing to say this is inspirational and this is the picture of who you could be, but how do we actually become like that? How do we, as sinful, broken human beings, become the kind of people that the rest of the world will knock on our door and say, hey, I want to become like you, not I want to run a million miles away from you. And it's interesting, there's something happening in our uh, society today that the, the, the number of people in Australia that self-identify as atheist is relatively low. Relatively low. But the number of people that identify as having no religion is growing rapidly. And more and more people are saying that even though I have a spiritual dimension to my life, I might be an atheist, I might be agnostic, or I might even be a believer of some sort. But you know what? I don't want to associate or I don't associate with any religion because that is just, it doesn't connect with my life. And you know, where uh, the area where we're planning a church down south, we did some studies of the, the local community and and it's amazing that four, nearly 45% of people in the city of Onkaparinga, which is just south of where Hallett Cove is, right down south, that re- 45% of people identify as having no religion. I'll give you an example. In the city of Sydney, 23% identify as having no religion. So deeply secular. But what, I, what I've noticed and observed is not many people in Australia say, I hate Jesus and I hate God and I don't care about spirituality. But they do say, I don't care about church or that religion is irrelevant to my life. And is that the fault of those people? Or is it that they have not found anything relevant in the church? And when I used to hear about being relevant, I used to think, yeah, it's kind of a bit of a lame word, as if we're trying to be relevant. Like, there's nothing more lame than trying to be relevant. Like, a dad, a mid-30s dad like myself trying to be cool, or trying to dress hip. And that's why I've just given up. I just embrace being the dad that I am. I embrace not trying to be funny. I just say dad jokes and hope that people laugh every now and again. And so that's what it means. To to be relevant is not to try to be cool. The word relevant actually has to do with being closely connected and appropriate. So if I'm relevant to a community, I'm closely connected to a community and I'm appropriate to that community. That There's actually something about me that connects. And I don't know about you, but I want us and I want the people of God, wherever we are, to be relevant, to be appropriate, to be able to connect with people because otherwise we're living in a spiritual bubble that doesn't help anyone. We become irrelevant. Even though the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, freedom and hope and purpose and meaning, people are craving for the good news of Jesus. People are craving for hope. People are craving redemption, but they don't look in the church. And that's where today's message comes in because God wants us to be the kind of people that people come knocking on our door. Amen? Let's read Ephesians 4, 1 to 6. If I preach a little bit, loud it's because I've just got four months of preaching frustration here as a prisoner for the Lord then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received be completely humble and gentle be patient bearing with one another in love make every effort to keep unity of the spirit through the bond of peace there is one body and one spirit just as you are called to one hope when you are called One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is Lord over all and through all and in all. Uh, This is God's word to us this morning. So I think we become irrelevant when there's a separation between the spiritual and real life. And God wants us to be people that are integrated between the spiritual and real life. When I, at Christmas time, I was listening to a preacher. I was over in Sydney and, a, and they preached a great message. But they said a little line that I disagreed with, and it was this. They said, being a Christian has nothing to do with good or bad, being a good person. It's all about Jesus and what he's done. And I understood what the preacher was saying, but 
I would put it this way, that to become a Christian and to receive God's love and kindness is not about being a worthy or a good person, to win God's favour as if we can ever fix our own brokenness and our own weakness and our own self-centeredness. But let me tell you that God cares about whether you live a good life. He does. And that God has actually called us as his children and loved us so that we can actually become better wives, better husbands, better parents, better lovers of people, more forgiving, more loving, that God hasn't just zapped us with these spiritual words and then we go back to living as hypocrites. In fact, God loves us just the way we are, but he doesn't want to leave us just the way we are. He takes us on a process and a journey to become more like himself. And that's not just good for the world, but that's good for us. And that's good for our enjoyment and our sense of feeling like I am doing what I've been created to do. Being a Christian does have to do with being a good person because Jesus, as we become more like him, we become more like his goodness. And so in the scripture here, it says, uh, today, if, if I can just have that script, oh, it's already up there, see? Before a word is in my tongue, Gannett knows it completely. Um, there we go. Um, let's look at those words. Be completely humble, gentle, patient, bearing with, another, with one another in love. May every effort to keep unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. That's what I'm talking about today. These are the words of how... We become the church that God wants to be. This is like what God wants us to enact. Not just the church out there, but our church and you and me in our families, in our communities, in our small groups, that we are going to be humble, gentle, patient, bearing with one another in love and keep unity in the bond of peace. That's what I'm going to talk about. But I don't want to just jump to the do this, do that. I love that first little phrase. I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you receive. Because most of us as Christians, those of us that have been around, around for a while, we would all say, oh, no, we're not worthy of God. None of us is worthy of Jesus dying on the cross for us. Jesus, you had to die on the cross because I was so worthy of that. No, we come to God and we say, thank you, God. We're not worthy of your love. We're not worthy of your forgiveness, but thank you anyway. He says, I, live, uh, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you receive. What it says is that you have received a calling. And it's like a platform. It's a privilege. It's an honour. It's an adoption. And God has given you something. And He said, I've given you a calling. It's not a calling to be a teacher or a full-time parent. Your calling is that you are a child of God and you are called to represent Him. And to become like him. That's your calling. He, it's not something you woke up one morning saying, I want to be religious. How boring is that? But it's saying, God, the God of the universe, I am going to live for you and, re- and acknowledge your presence and your leadership of my life. And I belong to you. And so I urge you to live a life worthy of your calling. And what that tells me is that many of us have a platform and a privilege and a position, but we live below that. And that there's a separation between who God says we are, who God says we can be, and the way we live our lives. There's a, there's a gap. And I believe God wants to help us to close the gap. You see, um, one of my favourite TV shows in recent times is The Crown. Has anyone seen The Crown on Netflix? It's really good. I love it. Um, and it shows the history of, like the story of Queen Elizabeth, And she has so many blessings. She has, I mean, she can wear the crown jewels. She lives in a palace. She has amazing corgis. Um, What a life she has. And, but you know what? She has received a privilege and a platform. But now for the rest of her life, she lives her life to serve her people. She's actually not free to do what she wants. She is a servant of the people. It's amazing. And in fact, in many ways, what it shows is that she didn't want to be queen. But she had a platform and she had to leverage that platform to serve. Her uncle, King Edward, had the same platform, but he threw it away for his own desires. And he ended up betraying his own country and butting up to the Nazis. And and he was a disgrace to his family. 
And it's just interesting that some of us have a platform and a privilege that we have not earned and we do not deserve. And God is saying, I want you to enjoy all the fullness of this platform. You haven't earned it, but don't live less than it. Our calling is not just to do stuff, but our calling is to Him. Our loyalty is to Him. But also in the context of the book of Ephesians, our calling is to one another. And that's what this passage is about. It's about saying we are called to live lives that are worthy of Him and the way we love one another so that people will look at the church, not that we're navel-gazing, not that we only care about other Christians, but people will look in on the dynamic and the love and the forgiveness and the beautiful authenticity of this community and they'll say, I want to be part of something that's real. I want to be part of something that's true and loving. I believe that this separation can come and there's a massive issue in our culture at the moment is the separation between rights and responsibilities. We live in a rights culture where even for some of us just hearing about, I urge you to live a life worthy of your calling. Who are you calling unworthy? How dare you judge me? And God would actually say to us that we have rights as children of God. We have privileges as children of God. We have blessings, but let's not just stay there. Because if you are a person that just receives good things from a parent or receives good things from the government or receives good things in society, but you do not embrace the flip side of the coin of rights as responsibilities, you will never enjoy life. You will never make a difference in this world and you will never become all that God has for you to be. In fact, I believe that there's... We've, we've almost run away from talking about responsibilities because we as Christians, we don't want to become legalistic. It's like, Philip, if, 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 we don't want to be like, if, if you don't do this, this and this, God won't accept you. God won't love you. If you want to be a good Christian, you have to do this, this and this. And we emphasize the unconditional love of God, that God loves us no matter what, which is true. But God loves us so much that He wants us to take hold of our responsibilities as His children. Think about a marriage. A marriage doesn't end when you get the rights of, you know, of a marriage. It's the rights and the responsibilities. When, you, when I became a, a parent, I had legal rights to access and to be a father in my child's life. But let me tell you, a few days in, and I had already failed one of my basic responsibilities. And rights don't bring you joy as much as, I mean, if people are abusing your rights, that's bad. But it's when we leverage and lean into our responsibilities, that's where true meaning and purpose and joy come. For instance, when I brought my daughter home from, well, when we were bringing our daughter home from the hospital, you know, my beautiful wife had gone through a very difficult labour and, and, and we're coming down, the women's and children's, and I had one job to do, and that was to install the car seat. And this is a common problem amongst new fathers. In fact, I know many of you in this room have failed in this area, so don't judge me. I reject your judgment in Jesus' name. Anyway, I came downstairs and, and got the car up. I'd spent a bit of, quite a bit of time in trying to install this car seat. And, you know, it was like my one job to do, to take the children, to take Amari home. And just the look of disappointment in my wife's face when she felt this car seat. I'm like, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. I've done it right. And it was so wobbly. I mean, the poor little newborn, she probably would have just toppled over. And I tried so hard, but you, sometimes you need an engineering degree to insert, you know, like to, 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 to do those things. However, now, if any of you have issues, I'm an expert with car seat installation. Come and see me. I'll do it for free. All right. But... I tell you, at that moment, there's something in me that I was, I was this girl's dad, but I felt like just I'd failed in a responsibility. And when you fail in a responsibility, it makes you feel bad. It doesn't make you feel like, oh, I'm really firing on all cylinders. Do you know what I mean? Let me tell you, we just went on a big family holiday and it was amazing for my long service leave. And I just was so nervous about taking my kids overseas. But we just achieved so much as a family. We took them on long haul aeroplanes, my very loud kids. And, um, and I drove on these crazy roads in this island called Ikaria, which the Greek island. And it was just, I mean, life or death was facing me every time I took the road. And, and, and I just felt 
like at the end of it, I just, I was exhausted. But I'd kept my kids alive for a month in Greece. <laughs> and like, we're walking through the streets of Athens and, and my son Jude, um, but the, in Greece is Vasily. He's just, he, he's great. He just runs. He's just a runner. So we had him on a leash and we were getting judgment from all the other parents. But I tell you, after that holiday, I was exhausted, but I felt such a sense of achievement. Do you know what I mean? Like, let me show you. There's some photos here. This is, my kids um, have got, this is where we went. This is a castle, uh, Kos, Koskina Castle in the middle of the island. And it's this massive steep road. That, just show the next one. Is there another one? Um, there's, this, there's these really narrow paths. Yeah, so you can actually see up there. That's the road that you drive up. And it's just sheer cliff down the side. And there was moments where I had to do a three-point turn on that. Cassie Pid was with us, and it was exciting. I was praying a lot. And, um, and, but the th- th- here's the thing. As, as a human being and as a dad, when I'm able to look after my family, it makes me feel like that's what I'm called to do. And when I'm not responsible, and th- that actually brings joy. It brings incredible joy. Think about the hardest things you've had to do at work but how much joy and, and achievement you have when you are able to do it. But if you're working in a job that no one cares about and it's not very challenging, you know like jobs that aren't challenging? They're also really boring. So I, th- I believe that actually in our society we run away from responsibility, but God actually would say, I've got things for you to do and I want you to do something great with your life. I've got responsibilities for you as a human being. And I think that that's what it means to live a life worthy of our calling. Um, Let's look at the first word. So, as a prisoner of Christ, be completely humble and gentle. Humility. What a great word. If you look at this text in Philippians 2, verses 6 to 8, right down the bottom it says, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death. That God, the eternal Son, emptied himself of his divine rights and became flesh and dwelt amongst us. He made himself nothing. So how do we live as responsible Christians? How do we become the church that God wants us to be in the way we relate in family and way we relate with one another? We have to be humble. John Dixon says that humility is holding power loosely for the sake of others. So if you want to be humble, and if we're going to be humble as a church individually, we need to hold our power loosely. As a church, if we think we're better than other churches or we think we're the best, then we're not walking in humility. As an individual, if you compare and contrast yourself to other people in this community of faith and you think you're better than other people and you're not willing to lower yourself and lower your power, then you're not being humble. If you're if you've got some roles in this church and mate, you, you just, you're in those toilets on a Sunday and someone has just, just done an explosion in the toilet and you're just thinking, nah, I'm just going to leave that for someone during the week or I'm going to leave that for someone else. I'm better than, or if you say, you know what? I actually want to go and clean that up because I don't want the next person, because you've got a servant attitude. You don't have to do it. It's not your job, but you've got that humble attitude. I like thinking of humility as power under control. It's not saying I have the power to do whatever I want. It's saying I'm going to limit my power and give over power for the sake of others. One of my favourite shows at the moment is This Is Us. Does anyone watch that? It makes me cry every time. And the dad in it is just a legendary dad. And he gives up his dream job of starting his own business for the sake of his three young kids to provide for his family. And I think there's something heroic about people laying down what they think is best for them for the sake of others. Don't you think that's heroic? There's something about that that just says, oh, I want to be a heroic dad. I want to be a heroic husband. I want to be a heroic pastor. That I'm not just about building my own kingdom. I want to give something of myself that would be good for me for the sake of other people. I think of someone like John Zumas, who every year, you know, John's a, fantastic young man in our church and he every year he sacrifices thousands and thousands of dollars to serve and bless the people of the Philippines serving feeding 
giving money, leading teams. And I know so many people in his phase of life that would just be going on Kentucky trips and whatever, and not, not there's anything wrong with going on holidays. I just went on a beautiful holiday myself. But I think for someone like John to give over the power that he has with his phase of life, with money, and just say, I'm going to lower myself to serve others. Isn't that inspirational? That's what it means to be the church. Power under control. The second characteristic is gentleness. And humility and gentleness go hand in hand. Be completely humble and gentle. Jesus says this, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. See, Jesus was so gentle. So I believe gentleness is not just about being physically gentle. I believe it's also got to do with being psychologically gentle, verbally gentle. See, some people that are really skinny, they've got no muscles, they can be some of the most violent and aggressive people in our society. They can react and spew out hatred. They can be violent. They can be all sorts of things. But then there's some people with the biggest muscles and they can be gentle because they use their muscles and they use their presence to protect others. You see, where humility is power under control, gentleness is strength under control. But if you really want to see what strength is, God, the eternal Son, the maker of the heavens and earth, he lowered himself to become like one of us. And even though he could have done whatever he wanted to kill and wipe people out, he chose the path of humility and gentleness, power and strength under control for a greater purpose. I just think that's one of the, if, if there's a fruit of the spirit that I speak over my kids more than any, it's gentle, particularly in our church playground. Gentle, when they've got a clump of hair of another kid. Gentle. It's really important. And so, what does that mean? But I think, seriously, it's with our words. Gentleness with our words. It's not just physical violence. It's, do you know sometimes when someone does the wrong thing and you can be very aggressive in the way you put them down? You can belittle people. But well, sometimes you can challenge someone, but you can be gentle. I wonder, with your partner or with your parents or with your children, do you correct them in gentleness or do you correct them in aggression? The next word is patience. And I always say patience is the one fruit of the Spirit that no one wants because it takes so long to get. It's frustrating. Patience could be said to be allowing for the shortcomings in others and enduring wrong rather than seeking revenge. You see, why would you want to allow for others' shortcomings when you can just try to change them? I love it when people are getting married and they're like, yeah, yeah, I love everything about this person, but there's just this one area. But you know what? Give me a couple of years, I'll get my hooks into them and they'll be fine. And it's just like, good luck. It's, I mean, do you love the person? Yes or no? Yeah, I love them. Will you love them even if they don't change? Yeah, I love All right, good, because they're probably not going to change. Because it's not our responsibility to change other people. It's not. And we have to allow for other shortcomings. And sometimes, rather than pointing out when people are wrong, just endure it. That doesn't mean if someone's abusing me and hurting me, I have to put up with it. But if someone is just a bit insensitive or whatever, part of being community is that we have to be patient with one another. Do you know why? Because they're patient with you. Like sometimes we think, oh, I have to put up with that person. Yeah, well, they have to put up with you too. And as human beings, we can become very unself aware of how annoying we are. Like we all have annoying traits and we have to be patient. And do you know what? God has been so patient to you. Yeah, I'm talking to you. He's been so patient to you. And um, can I just ask another question? Has anyone here had someone judge them on the basis of one mistake and kind of write them off or say they don't want to be in a relationship with you anymore? Yeah. Isn't that harsh? What about when someone says, yeah, you're this kind of person. You're like, no, I'm not that kind of person. I just made a mistake. And then they judge you and it's so painful. I've had someone, when I was um, a young, young adult, 
one of my friends, just, I made a mistake. My heart was in the right place, but I made a mistake, a genuine mistake. And she and her family basically cut me off from that moment. Um, It was something as small as I was meant to pick her up for an event. And I was not sure whether she was home or not. I honked my horn. I waited for about a minute. And then I drove off. But, but, hang on. Stop judging me. I don't need this. All right. But in the back of my mind, I went there because I thought she was meeting us at this event and I just went to her house just to double check. I thought I was being a good Samaritan. And then I thought, no, no, there's no movement. All the windows are shut. But anyway, her dad called me and just blasted me. He wasn't a Christian. He's swearing at me over the phone. I went back. She slammed the door in my face. And it's like, it was like a breach of friendship, which was never, and it was like, so harsh whereas I've done heaps worse things than that to people and they've forgiven me or they've been patient with me and they've just said okay yep that wasn't good but isn't it but isn't it harsh when people judge us on one or two mistakes and we need to be like that to other people because you know what you don't know what they're going through in their life you don't know what they've been through how bad do you feel when you've judged someone And you find, oh, I didn't know they were going through that. As Christians, we need to be really careful to be patient with one another. I call patience justice under control. You might think it's just, oh, I'm going to point to you the injustice of what you did to me. But sometimes we just need to say, God, you're just and you'll keep that person accountable. Now, patience is closely linked to forbearance or bearing with one another. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. What that means is, hey, if Pastor Bill insults me, I don't just have to be patient with him. I have to actually do life and walk with him. But it says to bear with one another. So I don't get just to come to church if um, Chris Kibitoglu says something to me. I don't just get to sit over the other side of church saying, I'm going to stay away from Chris Kibitoglu. The Bible says I need to bear with one another, which means we have relationship. It doesn't mean we'll be best friends it just means we need to learn to walk together as brothers and sisters because you know what I see around the church I see churches that say oh yeah the other Christians the the Catholics or the the Baptists or whatever yeah they're all right but they're still Christians but yeah we don't mix with them or we don't talk to them we need to be really careful or no I go to the same church as that person but yeah, I don't really have much to do with them. I don't really like them. We need to be really careful about erecting walls between us and other Christians where God says you are brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to be careful to walk with one another, to bear with one another. Imagine what it was like for Jesus at the Last Supper when he's having the bread and the wine and he's got Peter there about to deny him three times. He's got Judas about to betray him and Jesus is able to look at them in the eye and treat them with dignity. Forbearance, I call that judgment under control. That we actually reserve our judgment of other people. And we say, God, you are the God of justice and you are the God that will deal with other people. So, humility, gentleness, patience, forbearance, love. And Paul just adds, in love. Because what he's saying is you can't do this stuff unless the love of God is flowing through you. If you're just trying to be humble and gentle and patient, you're going to fail. But if you remember how lost you are without the love of God and how much the love of God has changed your life, you will actually have this river and this energy source, this flow to be able to love other people. The next word is unity. It goes on to say, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. If we want to be people that don't just say we're spiritual, but we actually outwork our faith in a practical way, we need to preserve the unity of our church and of our families. So so what that means is that we actually have to work at it. I love it in Matthew 18 where it says this, If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. So often I'll have people come and complain to me about someone else and, and my first response is, well, have you talked to them about it? Like Matthew 18 principle. And they look at you like you're speaking another language. 
Like, no, seriously, you, you what? You want me to talk to them about it? No, seriously, maybe just tell them that what they did really upset you and just try to you, you win them over. And it's like, no, nah, no, nah, I'm not doing that. You see, it's really important to preserve and maintain the unity of the body of Christ. When we talk about other churches, when we talk about Christians that might do it a little bit differently to us, we have to be careful with the way we share our opinions about other believers. Not just spiritual unity, but actual unity. And peace, the bond of peace. You see, peace is one of the fruits of God's spirit. And peace is the thing that we desperately crave more than anything else in our society, where we just want rest and we want peace. The peace of God, it means that all of the hostilities that would separate people in communities and society should not be true of the church. The groups at your local public school, the groups at your sporting club, the groups in society, different political factions, different political parties. When we come to church, we should recognise that there is a peace of God that has brought down the walls that separate us. Jew, Greek, male, female, Asian, African, Caucasian, Middle Eastern. Like the walls come down. And when we focus on the unity and preserving and protecting one another, the peace of God flows as well. The, you know what? I'm not going to do that. We're going to have shared communion together now. And one of the important things about communion is it's the time when we as followers of Jesus and in our church, we encourage anyone to take the bread and the cup. Um, if, if, if you're saying, Jesus, I believe in you, I trust you, even if you're from another church or another background, you can receive it today. I believe that if Jesus was here setting up a table and he set a meal up, he wouldn't say, no, you can't belong because you haven't been part of my table for a while. I think he would set a place for us. But one of the important things in the church in Corinth, can I have um, keys, please? In 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23, it says that in the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. Imagine someone coming to this church and saying, hey, it's great that you worship and you pray and you sing and you preach and all that sort of stuff. That's great. But what you do is causing more harm than good. The reason why it was causing more harm than good was because when they were sharing this supper together, the rich were going off to one room and they were drinking and boozing it up and they weren't leaving enough for the poor. And people were eating at different times and they were saying, yeah, yeah, we're Christians. Yeah, we're following what Jesus laid down for us in celebrating this meal. But what happened is all of the divisions and all of the things that separated people out in the world were being replicated and perpetuated in the church. Do you know what is going to set this church apart? Not our perfection, but it's the fact that God has loved us and then we Sometimes through a struggle, we love one another in such a way that when people come in, they don't think this is perfect, but they think there's something here that isn't easy, but it's good. There's something here that is so unnatural, but it's the way things should be. And God wants us to be part of that. You see, humility and gentleness in ancient Greek and Roman culture, they weren't Virtues, they were vices. In fact, if I said to you, ha ha, you're humble, you're gentle, that would be me putting you down, saying that you're less than, particularly if you're a man. If I said you were humble or gentle, that would be almost like me saying you're not fully a man. But Jesus came along and he redefined and he said, you want to know what life is all about? It's not about using your power to belittle other people, but it's using your power and using your strength to give and to serve and to love. Because at the heart of the universe is a God that didn't keep 
he, his power to himself, but in love he created and he gave and he entered into a world to redeem human beings that didn't want anything to do with him. But he said, I love them. I want them to be with me. So I'm going to give everything for them to be in a relationship with me. You see, God lowered himself and he gave for us. And when we give over our power, when we give over our judgment, there's something that happens in a community that is beautiful. It's dynamic. It's magnetic. It's a miracle. And so these early Christians, they were correct and they said, when you meet together, eat and drink together, reconcile relationships with one another, acknowledge that you are part of a body and acknowledge your place in it before you eat and drink. And that's what we're going to do together. So what I'm going to invite is I'm going to invite the ushers to hand out the bread and the cup. And once you receive the bread and the cup, stand to your feet and then we'll eat.